Resourceful Designer, Episode 40, Showing Courtesy Between Graphic Designers. Welcome to the Resourceful Designer Podcast, offering solutions to streamline your graphic and web design business so you can get back to designing. And now, your host, he prefers audiobooks to the paper versions, Mark Decote. Welcome to Resourceful Designer. I'm so happy that you've decided to join me today to stick me in your ears and listen to what I have to say about running a graphic design business. And I do appreciate the time you spend with me. There's so much other things you could be doing, spending it with family, working on client jobs, hunting Pokemon, if that's your thing. And I probably just dated the podcast here. If somebody's listening to this years in the future and you're saying, what's he talking about? It's that whole Pokemon Go thing that was a big fad in 2016. Now, I know it's been a few weeks since I put out an episode. And once again, if you're listening to this in the future and you're saying, what are you talking about, Mark? I just finished listening to an episode and I loved it so much that I pressed play on this one and I'm listening right away. But the fact is, if you are following the podcast live and listen to each episode as it's released, it has been a few weeks since I put out an episode. And I would love to say that I can guarantee a weekly release schedule for the rest of the summer, but truth be told, with holidays and vacations and just life in general, I think for the next little while it might be a little sporadic, but come fall, I will definitely be back to my weekly schedule. And once again, if you're listening to this in the future, it doesn't mean a thing to you. But this time around, I did come back from podcast movement. I spent the first week of July in Chicago at Podcast Movement, which is the largest gathering of podcasters in the world. And what a great time I had. I I took a couple of extra days. I arrived there a day before the the conference. And I had lunch with Wes McDowell of the Deeply Graphic Design cast. So we sat down, we talked about podcasting, we talked about graphic design. The industry had a great time. And then, of course, there was Podcast Movement that ran from the Wednesday through to Friday. And then I took the extra day on Saturday. I decided I didn't book my flight back to Ontario here until Sunday. So I had all day Saturday to explore Chicago since this was my very first visit to the Windy City. And what a beautiful place it was. Now, I have to tell you that I enjoy going to Podcast Movement. This is the second time last year they held it in Fort Worth, Texas. And I had a great time there. But at that time... I didn't have this podcast. I was doing my Solo Talk Media Network, which is a bunch of TV show fan podcasts that I do. And and you can check those out at solotalkmedia.com if you're interested. And I was there for that. But this year, my main focus was there representing Resourceful Designer. And I have to tell you that I got a lot out of this year's podcast movement. And I'm not just talking about how to improve as a podcast and different resources and stuff to help me. But just going there, representing a graphic design podcast, I picked up a bunch of new leads for my business. I've been hired to design some podcast artwork, which if you're not quite sure what that means, it's very similar to designing, say, album artwork from the early 70s and 80s and then CD artwork and cassette artwork. Well, podcasts are the new medium and designing artwork for them is the new big thing in that space. And I've been hired by a few podcasters that were there that found out I'm a graphic designer and we were discussing things and they hired me to design their artwork for their new upcoming show. And a couple of people actually hired me to not just create the artwork for their podcast, but to completely brand their business because they're starting a podcast as part of a business And we sat down in Chicago and we discussed things. And then afterwards they followed up and we we connected via Skype. And now there's two separate people that I'm working with to create an entire brand for their business, which includes their podcast. So it just goes to show that you can get work as a graphic designer anywhere you go. I went to Chicago because of podcast movement, because I love podcasting and I want to connect with other podcasters. But I came out of it with a few jobs that looking back, will have paid for my trip to Chicago. And you could do the same thing. Now, I'm not saying you go to podcast movement unless you really want to, but I'm sure you have hobbies, associations, groups you belong to that you can go out there and spread the news that you're a designer and who knows what will come of that. If you have kids that are in sports, I remember a few years ago when my daughter was playing competitive soccer and just recently when she was playing competitive volleyball, Both of those clubs found out I was a graphic designer and hired me to do work for them. 
So let people know when you go places. Like I'm not afraid to go up to somebody and start talking to them. And the way to bring it up is you go talk to the people and you ask them about themselves. And sure enough, they're going to turn around and ask you what you do. And that's when you can bring it up that you're a graphic designer and you do, if you do web or print or whatever, and that kind of piques their curiosity at times. And sometimes it might not bring anything right there, but it might be six months, a year later. Well, they'll remember you and they'll need something. And they'll say, well, I don't know any graphic designers. And they'll go, wait a minute. Wasn't so-and-so's father from the soccer team a graphic designer? Hmm, I might as well reach out to him. So whether you're part of any sports clubs, maybe you have some hobbies, maybe you fly model airplanes, you enjoy cycling or stamp collecting or, or whatever, let people know that you are a graphic designer because you never know when maybe the cycling club decides that they want to have special shirts made for everybody and they need somebody to design them because you never know when you can pick up work. And I wrote a blog post a year or so ago entitled 10 Proven Ways to Attract Clients. And in it, one of the things I mentioned is that when I first started my business, I had a t-shirt made that just said, hi, I'm a web designer. Is your site working for you? With a question mark. And I wore that when I went to trade shows, to conferences, and all sorts of stuff around town. And I got a lot of clients. I got a lot of questions and a lot of people asking things and advice and that. But I did pick up some clients just because people needed a web designer and didn't know who to turn to. And there's a guy with a t-shirt saying, hey, I'm a web designer. Come talk to me about it. So it just goes to show that no matter where you are, in, in what situation, there's always a possibility for you to pick up work. It's so much easier for us as graphic designers. I mean, if you're a car salesman and you go to a conference about podcasting and you say, yeah, I'm a car salesman. Well, you know, what are the chances that somebody's going to say, hey, I need a car salesman. Can you sell me a car? The chances are pretty slim. Similar, if you're selling insurance, maybe the person will need some insurance. But if you're going to a national conference or something, maybe that person is not from the same state or the same country as you. So that you're not going to get into the discussion about insurance and possibly get a sale out of that. But a graphic designer can work with anybody in the world. So no matter where you go, let people know that you're a graphic designer and who knows what could come of it. So anyways, that's what's been happening with me in the last couple of weeks. As I said, at the beginning of July, I went to Podcast Movement. And then, of course, because I took that week off, the week coming back was just bombarded with work and trying to catch up on things. And that's what happens when you run your own business and there's nobody to pick up the slack when you're away. But finally, I'm back in front of the mic here discussing graphic design with you. And I have a great topic today about showing courtesy between graphic designers. But before I get to that, I want to share my newest five-star review that I received in iTunes. And this one came in from Nikki T from the United States of America. And Nikki wrote, I have been an independent graphic designer working out of my home studio for over a decade. And I love listening to this podcast. Mark is so positive and helpful. Thank you for the generous time and for your great podcast. Well, thank you, Nikki. I do appreciate the kind words. And I love, love getting all these reviews. Now, if you haven't left a review yet for the podcast, please head on over to resourcefuldesigner.com slash iTunes, where you can leave your own review, which help other designers who stumble across the podcast. When they go and read the reviews, it helps them decide whether or not they want to listen. So thank you, Nikki, and to everyone else who has left me a review. I just realized I forgot to mention at the top of the episode that if there is any links, and I don't know if there will be or not, but any links that I do mention in this episode can be found by visiting resourcefuldesigner.com slash episode 40. Can you believe we're already at episode 40? Seems like it wasn't that long ago when I was just trying to think up, oh, how am I going to start this podcast? And now I'm already up to 40 episodes. And that means 40 resources of the week. Now, yeah, I know there's a couple of repeats in there. But for 40 episodes, I've been supplying a resource and this one is no different. And this week's resource, eh, maybe you can say it's a little bit of a cop out because I really don't know if we can use it in our graphic design business. But I've been having so much fun with this app on my phone lately. And it's an app called Prisma. Now, I know it's available for iOS right now. And according to the website, it'll be available for Android very soon. And from Prisma's website, which you can visit at prisma-ai.com, it says Prisma transforms your photos into artworks using the styles of famous artists, Van Gogh, Picasso, as well as world famous ornaments and patterns. A unique combination of neural networks and artificial intelligence helps turn your memorable moments into timeless art. And as I said, I, I actually read or tried to read through the terms of agreement for the app just to see if you are allowed to use 
the filters and the stuff in some sort of commercial capacity. And to be honest, it was all mumbo jumbo. And after a while, I didn't know what I was reading. So I just let it go. So if you do decide that you use the app and you want to use some of these images, please read the terms and conditions just to make sure that you are allowed if you plan on using them for commercial purposes. But I've just been having a lot of fun with the app, taking photos and applying different filters. And they do an excellent job converting just standard images into, as they say, make it look like a Van Gogh or a Picasso painting. And I've been having a lot of fun with it, but that's about it. As I said, it's not really helping me in my business, but it was just one of those things I discovered this week. And I says, you know what? It's so much fun. And as a graphic designer, I can appreciate what it's doing and the effects and the style and the design of these creations made from my photographs. Now, again, I don't know if I can use them. I don't have a reason to use them in anything, so I'm not going to dig in any deeper to see whether it's allowed or not. But I think you should give the app a try and just see how much fun it is playing with all these different filters. So once again, that is Prisma, and you can get it by visiting the iOS app store. It's available for your iPhone and iPad. And as I said, coming soon for Android. But if you want to know more right now, visit the website at prisma, P-R-I-S-M-A dash A-I dot com. And now on to this week's topic. And the topic is showing courtesy between graphic designers. Now, what I mean by this is when you're sharing stuff amongst designers. And let me tell you the reason why I decided on this topic. A few weeks ago, before I actually left for Chicago and podcast movement and all that, I was working on a project and I needed something from somebody and they sent me a Photoshop file. And this Photoshop PSD file contained hundreds and hundreds of layers and not a single layer was labeled. Some of them were on, some of them were off. There were groups, but the groups didn't make sense because when I'd hide a group, there was different elements all across the page that were being hidden and they weren't common elements that should be grouped together. So I don't know why they were grouped like that. And it was very frustrating to go through editing this document and trying to figure some stuff out on it because there was no rhyme or reason to how the layers were put together. Now, this prompted me to head over to LinkedIn and I posed the question in a couple of the graphic design groups there on what are some of the things that you would curse or praise a graphic designer who's handed files over to you for? And I got a lot of great response. Actually, it turned into a really hot topic and and lots of people discussing it and a really good thread there. But I kind of compiled some of the answers and some of my own things that I put in here just to let you know that when you're working on a job, you got to keep in mind that there's the possibility that other people might eventually be looking at this file and needing to work with this file. So you should have some sort of courtesy and, and not just for other people, but sometimes you might not look at the file for years. And when you come back two or three years later and you have to open up that file again, it's a real pain if you have to try to decipher everything you did a couple of years ago because you don't remember exactly how you worked on that particular project. So what I'm talking about is organization, naming conventions, file formats, choosing the right tools, and everything so that it would make it easier for the next designer that might have to take on this project. Now, maybe it's because you're working at a studio and one day you plan on leaving and somebody else might have to take over your files, or maybe you're running your own business and you're thinking that one day I'm going to retire and somebody else might take over. Maybe you're grooming somebody else to take over your business and they're going to have to start dealing with your files. Or maybe it's just as simple as you're designing something and this file might have to go different places. For different people to access. So have a little bit of courtesy in developing, in organizing, in naming, in gathering all this stuff so that the future designer that's working on it isn't cursing you under their breath. So I'm going to divide this talk into a few kind of subheads, if you will. And the first one is just talking about using the right tools. And all that means is, and and I'm hoping this is a novice or an amateur or a rookie problem and not somebody who's designing who've been doing this for a while, but maybe you are somebody who's just starting off and you're listening to the podcast because you're, you're thinking of starting a business or you're just getting into the design field. Well, maybe you'll get some good information here. And that is when you're designing something, make sure you use the proper tool for the job. I mean, yes, you could design a flyer or a business card and that in Photoshop, but really that's not what the program was designed for. 
you should be using some sort of page layout tool or even doing it in Illustrator if need be because those tools were made specifically for, for doing this sort of thing. I mean, it's very frustrating whenever you're handed something and say, here, like, here's a flyer I designed. Can you update it and, and do some stuff with it? And they send me a Photoshop file with all sorts of layers and, and just very unorganized. And as I said, Photoshop was not built to design flyers and design business cards. Yes, it is capable. And I have to admit, I've been guilty in the past of designing business cards. I've never designed a flyer in Photoshop, but I have designed a business card, but that was a special occasion. I really needed some of the effects and stuff because of what we were going with. But I could only count maybe one or two times in my 25 plus years graphic designing that I've actually designed a business card in Photoshop. I've designed the background and all sorts of elements of a business card in Photoshop. And then I would bring it into my page layout program where I would lay the text on top of it. So it's just a matter of using the right tools for a job. I know you can do stuff in InDesign. I'm, more, I'm a Quark Express person. I don't use InDesign. But I know both in Quark and InDesign, you can do vector work in there. And it's very possible to create an entire vector logo and all sorts of stuff in those tools. But those tools were not meant for that. If you're going to create something in vector, Use Illustrator or some other program that works specifically in vector files. So there's not much more to talk about this subcategory other than just say that if you're going to create something, use the proper tool for it. Because otherwise, future designers or people that will be accessing those files will be cursing you for not using the tool that should have been used. Now I mentioned vector files, so I might as well jump right in and talk about when you're working with vector files specifically in Illustrator. I know there's a lot of other programs out there now that you can do vector with, but Illustrator is the big one. It's the one I use. I'm sure it's the one most of you use. So I'm just going to talk about Illustrator. But when I do mention it, I'm talking about any program that does vector-based artwork. So when you're creating vector files, one of the things to keep in mind is layers and groups. It's great to be able to create all sorts of images and vector shapes and apply meshes and masks and all sorts of things. But when it comes to organizing the file, layers are your friend. If you're creating, say, a a landscape image all out of vector, you might want to put the sky on one layer and maybe the ground and the foliage on another layer. And then maybe if you have some houses and some people, you do them on all separate layers so that it comes really easy to turn stuff on and off. And you can group the layers too. Like if you have... Uh, Say you're doing a house, you do an an illustration, a vector illustration of a house. Well, you might have the roof and the chimney as one. You might have the door with its window and doorknob as another group. But all these separate groups could be in a a folder of some sort on the layers so that it makes it a lot easier to manipulate things and turn things on and off without having to sift through every little line in the file to try to figure out what is what. Now, I, I... going to mention right here, and this applies to Illustrator, to Photoshop, to InDesign, to Quark, to any program you have. It is so easy to label a layer or label a group that's in your layers that you should do it as soon as you create a layer. There is no reason to create a layer and leave it as the default layer two, layer three, layer four. It is so easy to just click on it and name it. You might not think it means much right now. It's so easy to work with, but once you end up having 20, 30, 40, 50, hundreds of layers, it becomes a real pain if none of the layers are labeled or none of the groups are labeled as what they do. So by labeling or naming your layers and your groups, not only does it make it easier for future designers that might have to look at this, but it makes it easier for you if you have to come back. as Again, six months, a year, two years down the road, if you have to come back and make a change to the file, it's so much easier if you can just look at your layers, say, that's the layer I need, and go for it. And I'm not just talking about illustrations. I'm talking if you're designing a logo and you might have some sort of icon element, you might have some sort of text element, and maybe you'll have some other things. Who knows? Maybe you have those fancy wreath-like leaves around it. I saw a funny meme on the Twitter the other day that said something about every design looks more professional when it's surrounded by a crown of leaves. So, But All these different things should be on separate layers and labeled so that if you need the logo and you only need the icon part of it, you don't need the text that goes along with it, you can hide the text easily by just turning off the layer and you don't have to select the text and hide it manually. Just turn off the layer and then you know you're not affecting it in any way. 
The same thing if your icon is made up of different shapes and elements, they should all be grouped together under one group called the uh, the icon or whatever you want to call it, the logo. But when you open it up, you should have all the different pieces of it labeled individually so that if you need to, you can turn one or two off or manipulate them or lock them in place while you work on something else. And what you do is you build a hierarchy. Now in the comments that were left on my post in LinkedIn, somebody gave the example of, say you're designing a monkey in Illustrator. Well, you're going to group different sections together and different sections would be, say the monkey's right arm might be made up of a bunch of different elements. Well, all those elements together you group them together into one group. Now, I'm not talking layers here. I'm just talking groups. So you group the right arm into one group. Then the left arm is another group. The right leg is one group. The left leg is one group. The head is one group. And the body is one group. So you have all these separate groups. And what you do this for is it makes it easy in the, in the future. Say the gorilla, you decide that the arm is not at the right angle and you need to move it. Well, you click on it and it's an entire group. So then it's just a matter of rotating the group till you get the arm at the proper angle. But then what you do is once you have the gorilla all formed and it's made up of these different groups, which are each of the body parts, then you take the entire gorilla and you group it so that it's one group. And that way, if you have a a scene, you can move the gorilla easily back and forth. It bugs me whenever I, especially when I purchase an illustration, say from one of those stock sites where you can purchase some vector illustrations and you get something and there's no groups Like say you purchase a background that has some swirling mists and some lines and a bunch of stars. Well, it bugs me when I have to go and click each individual stars. Like say I don't want the stars in the background. Everything else looks perfect, but I want to get rid of the stars. It would be so much easier if the stars were all grouped together so that if I click on one, they're all there and then I could just hit delete and I'm done. But no, some people, they're all individual. So I have to go through the illustration, clicking on each individual star and deleting them or or selecting them all and then deleting them. So have some courtesy, and if there's no reason for them not to be on a single plane, because, you know, when you group items, they all kind of go to the same plane, and if you understand what I'm working with, it's not layers as in the layer palette, but you imagine that one thing is on top of the other on top of the other. So if you have a bunch of elements and you group them together, they all end up on the same plane or same layer there. Again, not layer from the layer palette. So as long as they do in that sense, then group them together. Now, some other things to do with vector files, and this is mostly whenever you're handing files over to people, outline any text that you have. Because what are the chances, unless you're using Times or Helvetica, and even then, there could be some problems. So if you're going to hand over a file to anybody else, outline the text. Now, I have something, I've been doing this for years, ever since I can remember. I always have two files that I'm working with whenever I'm doing vector. I have my .ai file, which is my working file, where my text is intact and everything is intact. And then I have my EPS file. And the EPS file is always the final file, the one where I've outlined all the texts, I've done whatever I need to do. And basically the EPS file is the one that I would use for print, the one I would send if somebody requires a copy of the logo or a copy of the image, I would send them the EPS file. The AI file is my working file. So I always have those two, if not multiple copies, but I always know right off the bat, like say if I have to know what font was used in in a certain logo or something, I know that by opening the AI file, the font will be there and I'll be able to tell right away. If I open the EPS file, I don't have a clue because the font's been outlined. So that's a good way to work on things and, and always make sure you give the file to somebody else if you're sending it somewhere, that you have that final file, whether it's an EPS or a PDF or whatever you're saving. Or maybe it will be an AI file, but you're going to label it different. But make sure that you have one where everything is outlined so that nothing can go wrong. Now, I know I go a little bit farther in some cases. I like outlining my strokes if it's possible. If there's a vector file and I have, say, a font and there's a stroke around the font, well, I will actually outline that stroke so that it becomes a filled shape as opposed to a line with a stroke on it. Now, the reason I do this is this is going back many years to the print shop I used to work at and the rip that we used to use in order to produce the film that would then be put onto the printing plate that would go onto the press. Well, the rip we used, which if you're not sure what it is, just it's a glorified printer, but the printer we used had issues sometimes where depending on the file, it wouldn't produce strokes properly. If you put down a 
three point stroke. Well, sometimes it might show up as a three point stroke, but sometimes it might show up as a 0.25 or sometimes a much bigger and it would just cause a lot of problems. There was also an issue back then where it was really hard sometimes to scale a vector image if you had a stroke because the stroke wouldn't always scale properly or somebody would forget to check off the feature where the stroke would scale along with the rest of it. So I just got into the habit of outlining all my strokes. Now you might be thinking, wow, well, you know, I have thousands of stroke in my image. There's no way I'm going to go through and outline them. And I don't blame you. Uh, In that case, I might not as well. But in some cases, like I just did a t-shirt design for somebody and it was just a simple two color design. And the screen printer asked me to add some trapping onto the image because he, he wanted to make sure that the two inks overlapped a little bit. And I simply did that by taking one of the colors, adding a stroke onto it, making sure the stroke was set to overprint. But just to be safe, I created an outline out of that stroke so that it was a solid element and I knew that there was nothing that was going to happen to it. And the print job turned out perfect. It, maybe it would have turned out perfect if I would have left it as strokes instead of outlining them. But that's just me, the way I work. I'm going to quickly finish off the vector section here. Another thing, unnecessary clipping masks. If you're creating an object that is four inches by four inches and what you have is six inches by eight inches, it's very easy in a vector file to just create the four by four box, put it where you need and make a clipping mask out of it so that everything outside that box is hidden. But that's kind of the lazy man's way of doing it, especially if you end up having hundreds of layers and all sorts of clipping masks, it gets really confusing. So if at all possible, use something like the Pathfinder tools or some other way to slice that background so that you can create a four by four image there as opposed to a larger image that is just clipped to four by four. Trust me, future graphic designers will really appreciate it. And finally, if you're going to hand off any sort of vector file or illustrator file to somebody and you have any sort of embedded images in it, please include the images. I mean, sometimes you can get away with it, but that is one of the big concerns that we have when we're receiving files is people often think that the images are embedded into the vector file and sometimes they're not and it causes all sorts of problems. And again, if you're not going to outline the fonts, and I don't know why you wouldn't outline the fonts, but if you are going to save it with the fonts intact, please, please embed the fonts into the file. Otherwise, the file is of no use to whatever designer opens it up afterwards. So that's my little spiel on creating vector files. Now move over to Photoshop. And again, lots of different things you can do here in Photoshop when supplying a file for somebody or just creating a file for yourself. For one thing, If somebody asks for something, a Photoshop file, the easiest thing to do to make sure nothing happens to it, flatten your artwork and send it to them. Unless they specifically need to edit it or alter it in any way, there's no reason to give them a Photoshop file with hundreds of layers or even a dozen layers where there's the possibility that something can go wrong. So whenever possible, flatten your artwork and send them the flattened version. That way you know that it's going to show up exactly the way you sent it to them. Now, I know that's not always the case. Sometimes you have to send the layered image because maybe they're going to be doing something. They're going to be altering things at their end. And that's fine if it's called for. But in that case, again, layers. Just like I mentioned when talking about Illustrator and vector files, Photoshop files with layers and groups that are not named is a real pain. So please, as I said, it takes so little time. When you click on create a new layer, Quickly just click on it, name it something, and that's it. You're done. It took you less than three seconds, maybe five seconds, depending on how long you're going to name it. But trust me, that five seconds is going to help you in the long run or help the future designer that's going to look at the files. But even if it's just for yourself, I love opening up a file that I did several years ago and knowing right away what every little piece of that file is because I have my, my layers named properly and I could quickly go down my layers and say, that's the one I need or I need to turn that off or, or whatever. Now, do keep in mind when you are handing over a Photoshop file, a layered Photoshop file, there's a good chance that whoever receives the file might not have the proper fonts. And even if they do have the same font, sometimes the fonts come in and things happen to them And I don't know how many times, even something as simple as Helvetica, you think that's universal, but it's not. 
you can open up a Photoshop file that was created by somebody else and they used Helvetica and you say, well, I have Helvetica on my system, but when you open it up and it says, this isn't the right font, do you want to, I forget the exact wording that Photoshop gives you, but saying there's going to be some reflow or something. And when you click it, you see the font move a little bit. And that's scary to me because I don't know if the font moved to what it should be or if it moved out of position from what it should be. So if you're going to supply Photoshop files, supply the fonts. And I know that can get a little scary, especially with licenses and maybe who you're giving it to might not be allowed to use the fonts depending on what your license is. And maybe you don't want to supply them and that's okay. In that case, rasterize the font before supplying it because you don't want to see something happen to that file and it print off and it looks horrible because the font wasn't right or worse, the person at the other end didn't have the right font. So they substitute some other font for it, which ruins your design. Now, another pet peeve of mine whenever I receive a Photoshop file is hidden layers. Why are there layers in this Photoshop file that are hidden? Are they there for reference? Are they just layers that were no longer used, but the designer was too lazy to delete them? It makes you wonder, like, is there a reason? Do I need them? Do I not need them? Why are they there? If you have layers in your Photoshop file that are hidden and they're of no use, please delete them. And if there is a reason for them to be there, include it in the name of the layer. Maybe the layer is the key line for the die cut of the job. Well, name it. Say this is the, it's hidden, but name it as the key line or the die cut line or the scoring line or whatever. So that at least somebody that gets the file will know, okay, there's a reason why this is hidden because, you know, you're looking at the design. You don't really need to see where everything's cut up or sliced up or die cut or whatever. But it's nice to know that that layer is there to indicate it if I do have to see it. Now, the other thing in supplying Photoshop files, and I, when I say this one, I don't just mean Photoshop files. This could be JPEG images, TIFF images, GIF, PNGs, whatever. Out of courtesy, try to convert them to the proper color space that you know they're going to be used in. I do a lot of print design, so a lot of my images are saved in CMYK because that's the format I want for printing them out. But if a client calls me up and say, hey, Mark, you know that image that you used on our brochure, we'd love to put out on our website or some company is asking for that image to put on their website that'll link back to us. Can you send us a copy of it? Well, sure, I'll send them a copy, but I'm not going to send them the CMYK because they just told me that it's going to be used on a website. I'm going to convert it back to an RGB and save it as a JPEG or a PNG or something, especially if I had it as a TIFF file to begin with. I'll save it in a format and in a color space that I know they're going to use. Just like if one of the local newspapers contacts me and say, hey, do you have the high-res version of such and such an image that you used on so-and-so's website? We're putting a little piece together, an editorial on them, and we'd love to use that image. But the one from the website is too low-res. Well, sure, I have the high-res image. But if it's going to a newspaper, then I convert it to CMYK before I send it to them. Now, I know it, they can do it on their end, but it's just courtesy. It's one less step that they have to worry about. And when they get the file, they know that I know what I'm talking about and that I'm supplying stuff in the way that they can use. And always, 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 if at all possible, supply something high res or at least higher res than they need. If somebody says they need an image to go on the website, this is one case where I won't do what I just said before. If I have a 300 DPI image and they say they need it for the website, I'm not going to convert it to a 72 DPI. I'll supply them with the 300 DPI because, again, I don't know. Are they going to be using it as a 200 by 200 pixel image or are they going to use it as the background of a website at 1,000 plus pixels? So in that case, supply something that they can use and that they can manipulate the way they need to. So those are different things to think about in Photoshop. And again, these are all things you should be doing for yourself. Naming your layers, getting rid of hidden layers that are not needed. I know when you're working Sometimes it's so easy to just, oh, I don't need that. I'll just hide it and you leave it. And then it ends up bloating your files and using up more hard drive space. So if it's something that you aren't going to use, at least at the end, go through and delete these hidden layers or unused objects that you're, you don't need anymore. I'm a bad one in, uh, sorry, I'm going to jump back to Illustrator. I'm a really bad one in Illustrator where I will put stuff off of my artboard. So the artboard is the actual page size. I know it's not a page, but the actual page size you're working on, and then you got that gray area around it. Well, I'm one that I'll often put stuff off to the side that I'm not currently using. 
but I make sure before I save the final copy, I will delete all that stuff. No, it never gets printed. If you were to send this job to the printer, that stuff in the side wouldn't show up. But you know what? If you do create a PDF file and you send it to somebody, even though it never shows up, that information is still there. So there's no reason for it to be there. Delete all that stuff before you save your final file. Okay, so that's enough about Vector and Photoshop. I want to talk a little bit about page layout programs. And this might not apply to all of you. Some of you are only in web design, where Photoshop and Illustrator might be stuff that you would use, but you don't necessarily use page layout programs. But there are some stuff about page layout programs I want to discuss a little bit about. And again, this is for yourself, just as much as future designers that are going to access the files. And that's just to learn how to build a proper document in a page layout program. Heck, it doesn't even have to be a page layout program. If you're working in Word, which please do not design anything in Word, but if you for some reason have to do something in Word, do not, and I repeat again, do not hit the line break or line break or or return on your keyboard, return, 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 all the way down to the bottom of the page because you want the next thing to be on the next page. I've seen this in page layout programs where somebody will design something and they have a heading and then they want to have this big space. Well, instead of adjusting the letting or or playing with some numbers to get the proper spacing, they'll just sit there and hit return like four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times in order to create that space. Well, that's not the proper way of doing it. Yes, it can be done that way, but it's not the proper way of doing it. And trust me, the next designer that comes and takes on that file will be cursing you. Not to mention if you are doing it in something like Word, man, the headaches that causes when you share files between computers. Because sometimes on your computer, it might have taken 15 carriage returns in order to get it to the next page. But when you send that to somebody else, for some reason, 15 carriage returns puts it halfway down the second page. So learn how to to use the tools built into the program to either get it to the next page or to create, create more space between lines. The same thing goes with if you're trying to indent something. Don't use your space bar for indenting. There's a tab key on your keyboard for a reason, and all these programs, whether you're using Quark Express, whether you're using InDesign, whether you're using Word, whether you're using Pages, all of these programs have some sort of way to manipulate tabs so that hitting the tab key on your keyboard will move your text up to where you want it to a certain point. So don't just sit here hitting spaces to try to move stuff where it needs to go. Or don't sit there and hit multiple tabs. Why don't you adjust it and put the tab exactly where you want so it takes one tab. And then it makes it easy in the future. If anything ever has to be adjusted, you don't have to play with a whole bunch of different tab spaces. You just adjust one tab and everything moves. Now, another thing to keep in mind, and this is more for programs like InDesign and Quark Express that use boxes to put their text in, is when it, whenever possible, Use a single box to put your text in. It bugs me whenever I get a document, whether it's an InDesign document or a Quark Express document. And to be honest, I don't get a lot of those these days anymore. But it really bugs me whenever these documents come in and everything is on multiple or in multiple text boxes. You'll have the heading in one box and then maybe one paragraph in another box and another paragraph in another box and then a subhead in its own box. There's no reason for that. You can have one box And just learn how to space everything properly. If you need a certain space between paragraphs, use the paragraph styles to create that space as opposed to having a separate box for each paragraph. There's no reason for that. Speaking of paragraph styles, if you do use InDesign or Quark Express, learn how to use the style sheets. I know they're called style sheets in Quark Express. I presume they're called style sheets or or character styles, paragraph styles in InDesign. To be honest, I don't use it enough to really remember what they call it. But learn how to use those things because it becomes so easy if you need to change something in the future to just go change a style and have it adjust across your entire document. And don't just learn how to set them up and then go in and manipulate them in the document itself because that usually causes problems and will break things. If you learn how to use the style sheets properly and you need a special situation for a certain paragraph or or one page, create another style sheet just for that one page and use it. Trust me, in the long run, when you come back, say you do something for somebody one year and the next year that event's happening again and they need to change some some things on it, it's so much easier to go back and put in all the new information and then just click on the style sheets and say, okay, this style, this is a header, this is a paragraph, this has a sub quote or, or block quote or whatever. 
And you can go through and reformat a document so quick. I do a membership directory for a client of mine, and it's every two years. And actually, it's just coming up. We're getting ready to do the, the next one for the next two years. And it's so easy. They just give me all the membership information in a Word doc. I drop it into my page layout program, which is Quark Express. And all I have to do is go through it. And I have all my style sheets set up and I have hotkeys on them. So all I do is click on a heading, hit the hotkey, and there it's already formatted. Click the description, hotkey, formatted, and so forth through the entire document. So something that would normally take a lot of time just highlighting and changing everything, using style sheets can make it so much faster. And again, when you pass this document on to another designer and they see the style sheets, and if they understand style sheets, they will appreciate this document so much more because of it. Now I'm going to mention this here, and this really, I don't know if it really applies to this podcast topic, but I actually got into a debate not too long ago about double spaces or not after a period. And maybe you'll disagree with me, but I'm just going to put my two cents out here. There should not be a double space after a period. That was from a time when typewriters would monospace characters, and so which means every character had the same amount of space, whether it's the letter I or a W. And when you put a period that had the exact same amount of space as a W, you needed to hit the space bar twice in order to create a good space between sentences. But obviously, we don't use typewriters anymore. We're on a computer where most of the fonts we use are properly spaced or kerned. So there's no reason to do a double space. And I know there are some people that are still old school and insist on it. But if you're getting into this and you're doing stuff on your own, please, please don't use the double space after the period. It is no longer needed. Now, the last thing I'm going to talk about in page layout programs is just linked files. If you have to supply something to somebody, whether it's an InDesign file or a Quark Express file, please do. Uh, I know in Quark it's called Collect for Output. I don't know what it's called in InDesign. I apologize. I should have looked before recording the podcast. But that's where it gathers everything that's required for that file and puts it into a single folder, which makes it easy to share. Meaning all the images, anything that's attached to it, fonts, information about the file, everything is gathered in that one folder so that when you share it with somebody, when you pass it on to another designer, when you pass it on to a printing company or wherever it has to go, even giving it back to the client, everything that is needed to open and run that file is there in that folder. So that's my discussion on page layout programs. I'm going to touch briefly on PDF files. Two things to keep in mind. Whenever you create a PDF file, and PDF files are the most shared documents these days, other than like JPEGs or or something like that. But if you're going to share a document between yourself and a client or yourself and somebody else, chances are it's going to end up being a PDF file. Two things to keep in mind. When you're creating the PDF file, unless you're doing it because you're trying to save space because you need the absolute smallest file size, When you go to embed the font, don't embed the subset. Embed the full font. Because if anybody ever has to go in and edit that PDF, if you've just embedded the subset, it becomes a real, real pain. Now, if you're not sure what I mean by that, when you create a PDF in most programs, you have the option of embedding the font, and then there's a checkbox that says embed the subset. And what the subset means is if you have a font, say, that's only being used as the heading, and it's two words and uses a total of maybe 10 characters because maybe the letter A and the letter E are repeated or whatever. Well, when you embed a subset, it only embeds the characters that are actually used in the document. So if the letter W was not used in your heading and that's the only place where that font is, the letter W is not embedded in the PDF file. So if later somebody has to edit that heading and add the letter W to it, They can't because it's not there. Unless they have the font, now they would have to change the font of the document in order to get that letter W or try to find something that matches and it's a real pain. So if you embed the full font, then it embeds all the characters whether they're used or not. So it makes it a lot easier. So try to get into the habit when you're creating a PDF file to embed the full font and not just a subset. As I said, unless it's a PDF file that you're going to be putting on a website and you, for download and you need it to be as small as possible, then okay, do it that way. But otherwise, get in the habit of embedding the full font. And the only other thing I want to touch on on PDF files is, again, before you make the PDF file, please make sure that your images are in the proper color spaces for what they're going to be used. If this is a PDF file that eventually will be printed, then make sure that all the images 
that are embedded in the PDF file are in CMYK. If it's never going to be printed or if it's just going to be used on a website for download, then maybe you can get away with RGB images, but chances are at some point somebody's going to print it. And if you have RGB images embedded in it and they go to print it CMYK, it really dulls the images down. So if at all possible, convert your images to CMYK before creating the PDF file. That's the only two things I want to talk about PDFs. And the last little bit I want to talk about is file management when it comes to sharing files. And basically all that is, is keep your files in a proper structure. Keep them together. If you have a bunch of files that are all related, whether they're images, resources, or anything, keep them all into a single folder. My structure, I like to have a folder for a project. And within that folder, I will have a folder called images where all my images go there. And if need be, I'll divide that one into photos and vectors. But most of the time, it's just one folder called images. Then below images, I will have a folder called supplied. So if a client supplies stuff, like say they supply a photo for me to use, well, it would be in that supplied folder. But then I would open it up in Photoshop, make sure everything's okay, make sure it's convert it to the proper color space, and then I would resave it in the images folder. But the supplied one is there untouched, as well as any content, any Word documents, anything that the client supplies to me would be in that supplied folder. Then I also have a folder called working. And again, that's where my working files are. So my .ai files, if I'm working on vectors, will be in there. And then the final images will be in my image folder where the EPS file would be. But the working files are there. And that's Again, it's my working files. It's everything I need. If I have an image that I'm building in Photoshop and I'm saving the PSD file, it would be in my working folder. And the main folder for the project, the only thing that should be in there is if I need a page layout program. So in my case, it would be my Quark Express file would be there and my final PDF. Any proofs, again, I would create a folder called proofs and I would name my proofs, proof number one, proof number two, proof number three, And in my case, what I normally do is say the client says, I really like proof number two, but I need to make this little change. Then I might go 2B, 2C, 2D until they want a drastic change, in which case it becomes proof three. But that's just the way I work. So just make sure that everything is structured properly. And again, this makes it easier for you. If you come back to a project a year or two down the road and you open it up and you see this well-structured, well-organized file, you're going to appreciate what you did. And if you pass this on to anybody else or anybody else has to come in and and take over for you, they're going to appreciate it that much more as well. And once again, in the working files, that's where you make sure that you've got all the fonts, nothing is outlined and so forth. So that again, a year down the road, if the company calls you up and says, uh, what font did we use in our logo? You can easily just go into your working files, open up the AI or the, the Photoshop file and see exactly what font was used. Now, when it comes to naming your files, as I've seen designers in the past, and I don't understand this, designers that will get cute with their naming. Like they'll do something, like they'll name something as a little inside joke to themselves, which has absolutely no meaning to anybody else. Like it's frustrating when you open up a folder and you see a bunch of photos and they're named stupid photo, another photo, yet another photo, third photo change. Like, okay, that might mean something to you, but to any other designer, it doesn't mean a thing. Name the photo what it actually is. If it's a photo of a woman sitting in a canoe, name it woman sitting in canoe. If you need another copy of that photo, but you need the clouds removed from the sky because you're going to be putting text there and it was too busy a background, Rename the photo, woman sitting in canoe, clouds removed. Name your files what they actually are. It's really frustrating when you look at a bunch of files and you have no idea what the files are because you don't understand the naming convention. So when you're naming a file, keep in mind that you would want to name them the same way you would want to receive a file from somebody else, some way that you can understand it. And also, please indicate the final file. If you create some job, and this is the final, this is the one the client approved on. Myself, I always add hyphen final to the end of the file. So I know that's the final file. And if the client comes back and makes a change or something, I will delete that from that file and create a new one with the final on it. And that goes to the PDF file. It goes to the Photoshop file. If it's done, the Illustrator file, whatever, I will put hyphen final at the end of it 
so that I know that's the final file. And again, years down the road, if I have to go back and look for it, I don't want to have to look through a whole bunch of files to figure out which one is the most recent. I don't want to look at modification dates. I want to look at the structure and just say, there's the one with hyphen final at the end of the title. That's the file I need. So anyways, that's kind of what I wanted to talk about today is just the courtesy and just when you're building your files, when you're creating your designs, keep in mind that you might not be the person in the future working on these. Whether you sell your business, whether something happens to you and somebody else has to take over your your client's work, maybe you have a falling out with your clients and they request all the files or for whatever reason. Now, I, I know in that case, maybe you don't want it to be easy for them, but you're also making it easier for yourself in the future. So take the time as you're building the files to name them properly, create the layers that are required, organize everything in groups, name the layers, create the proper color spaces and structure and everything that's needed, and you'll benefit, you'll be so much happier for it in the future. Now, I know I didn't even touch on web design I could probably create an entire new episode of the podcast just on courtesy and etiquette with web design because that is something, I mean, when you take over somebody else's code and you're trying to look through it, trust me, there's a lot of things that you could be cursing the other designer about or praising him. When you when you open up the source code that somebody else had created and you see all the comments everywhere explaining what every section of the source code does, those are the times when I think, wow, that was a good designer because they it made it so much easier for me to go through the code and see what everything is. And if I need to change something, it's really easy to look and find exactly what I need to change. But as I said, I'm not going to get into the whole website side of that because I could create an entire podcast episode just on that. Not to mention that this one is going a little bit long, but eh, I haven't put out an episode for a few weeks, so I'm going to let that go. But that's my topic for this week. Now, as always, I do have a question of the week, and this week's question comes in from Tyler. And Tyler's question is, he says, I was listening to one of your recent podcast episodes and you mentioned that you're building websites for two direct competitors. How do you handle ethical dilemmas? Like, for example, working for competitors. Well, thanks for your question, Tyler. And to be honest, I just don't worry about it. Yes, they are two competitors, but I just treat each of them as an individual client. No different than if I was working for one client in the automotive industry and one of them that makes cupcakes. I would treat each client individually and give them the attention they deserve and the focus. And the same goes for two different clients in the same industry. I mean, I've been doing this for years. I have two clients that are two competing golf courses in my area. There's only two golf courses in my, uh, sorry, there's three. One of them's a little bit farther out, but two golf courses in my immediate area. Both of them have been clients for quite a while. Now, do they know that I'm designing stuff for the other one? I don't know. I never brought it up. I never mentioned to one of them that I was doing stuff for the other. I never mentioned to the other one that I did stuff for the first one. But when I go meet with one of them, they have my undivided attention. And even sometimes when they talk about, oh, you know, this other website is doing this and we need to find a way to do something better. I'll just listen to what they have to say and and agree with them. I don't have to tell them that I designed that other website. It's not important to the conversation I'm having with the client. Now, do I have to be careful in working with each of them? Yes. I mean, I, I don't want to badmouth one client to the other. And if they start badmouthing them, I tend not to agree. I'll just let them go on about it. And other things, I also try to be careful that I don't show any sort of preference to one client over the other by, by creating a better design, which kind of is a little tough. But as far as an ethical dilemmas, no, it's no different than working with any other clients. I've I've had several clients that were financial planners. At one point, I think I had four different financial planners that I was doing work for. All of them ended up with great designs. They all look completely different. At one point, I was designing stuff for two different flower shops. They were both competitors. So it's just learning to keep each client on their own. When you're talking to them, focus on them. And when you're working on their stuff, focus on their own stuff. Now, uh, yeah, in this situation, you mentioned that uh, I just recently mentioned it on a podcast episode. This is a little different in that it was the exact same day that I received the contracts from two different competitors. And it was just funny because both of them, when I sat down to meet with them before they signed the contract, both of them were talking how the reason they were doing a redesign was because they were trying to compete with the other one. 
So that was a little bit interesting. Again, they don't know that I'm working with the other one. And even if they find out, I'm going to create two completely different designs that both of them are going to be happy with. And I'm going to put just as much effort into each one so that I won't be playing preferences. So that's the way I handle this question, Tyler. I don't know if other people agree with me. Maybe some people won't take on a client because they say it's a conflict of interest because they already have some other clients in the same industry. But then again, there are people that specialize. I mentioned how I I think it was in the last episode or the episode before that, that I knew a, a woman who specialized in making websites for the dental industry. So that's what she did. She made websites for dentists. So every single one of her clients was technically a competitor. And she made a good go at it until she finally exhausted and had designed websites for almost all the dentists in the area. And then she was having trouble branching out into outlining areas and she ended up changing her her business practice. But for a while there, that's all she was doing was websites for dentists. So every one of them was competitors. So anyways, that's my take on it, Tyler. Thank you very much for the question. If you listening to this agree with me, disagree with me, have other comments for Tyler, please visit the show notes page at resourcefuldesigner.com slash episode 40 and leave a comment there and give me your opinion. So that's it for this week's episode. As I said, a little bit longer than normal, but I'm going to let that go just because I haven't had an episode in a while. And before I leave, I just want to let you know that next episode coming up will be all about naming your business and the different strategies you can take and how it will affect your, your business as a whole and how you go about naming it. So keep an eye out in your feed for that one. And once again, my resource of the week this week was Prisma. As I said, I don't know if it's going to be any use to you, but I've been having a lot of fun with it in the past couple of weeks, just playing with all sorts of images I have on my phone. And you can get that by visiting prisma-ai.com or just look for Prisma in the App Store and soon to be available on Android. If you want to reach me, I am on Twitter at ResourcefulD and on Facebook at facebook.com slash resourcefuldesigner. And if you have a question you'd like me to answer in a future episode of the podcast, please visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash feedback, and you can use my form there. Well, it felt really great to be back behind the mic talking graphic design again with you. I did miss this, and I hope it doesn't go that long again between now and the next episode. But as I said, over the summer, there will be some sporadic scheduling there. But come fall, I think everything will get back to normal. But until next time, I am Mark Decote, wishing you all the best with your graphic design business and reminding you to stay creative. Thanks for listening to the Resourceful Designer Podcast at resourcefuldesigner.com.